Right, tell me things. I come oh. out of my I know all the answers mode and go into, please tell me what life is all about. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, what is it all about? What is it all about? Mm. Ah. It's been a <laughs> fairly, I don't know, disrupted period. I guess that's probably the same for most people. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. How, how is it for, for, for you during, over this period, over you know, late December, January? Is it, is it just me or is it just... Uh... Yeah, it's just you. Everything else is fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just just feel um, disrupted and unsettled. <clears throat> so I guess I haven't really wanted to talk to anybody, frankly. Um, so it just just because my mind just wasn't um, sufficiently settled. So I don't know. Do you do you go through periods like that? I have such a bad memory, I can never remember anything that's bad oh, you, in the past. Or oh, oh, good, really. It's just everything is just day to day. There obviously was a past because I didn't always look like this, but uh, I just can't remember what it was like. So you feel uh, unsettled inside you? Or is it just life is around you? Is, is, is... Well, because I mean, well, you got don't... a lot of fires in, and you know, a well, lot yes, of okay. things yes, in the fires, usually. Well, yes, that and that is still the case. So nothing has gone away. Well, a few things have gone away, but not, not all of them. Uh, I just 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 that, that that time of the year where, where nobody's in one place, people are moving. Um, um, you know, the work patterns are not. Uh, what, what they usually are. People are, are not where they usually are. And so, you know, there's really no planning that can be done or, or, you know, there's no real certainty. But on the other hand, it's actually quite, you know, I actually find it, found it quite good because it, it, uh, the whole house was uh, empty uh, as it usually is this time of the year where, where sort of you know, everybody shoots off wherever. Um, uh, and I actually find that's probably you know, the, the better time of the year where I'm you know, completely alone. Um, and I, I guess that's probably that, that's probably one reason why I take advantage of that, just not to, to communicate at all. So, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is disruptive and uh, unsettling and uh, not really conducive to, I guess, um, I guess planning, I guess is what I'm trying to do. Uh, How come though? Because you're in a Muslim country. What is all this thing around Christmas? Or is it New Year? Um, or what do what 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 is the well, the whole thing? Yeah. It's all about holidays and uh, this is the traditional holiday period. It's sort of they they pretty much follow the, the Western patterns of holidays. Okay. With, with the exception of uh, Ramadan of course. And so you know Christmas, they, they sort of you know, get a few weeks off just because you know everybody else, all the all the business people are Chinese and they're and they're Christian and they're not going to work, so you know automatically all, all their employees or you know um, native Indonesian um, have got nothing to do. So de facto they they're on holiday whether they want to or not in a lot of cases. So. Okay. What, that, be even presents at all? Present? Oh no, no, not presents. No, That's not, not really. Present. No, not really a thing. Okay. Um, I mean, it's just sort of. You, you'll get all the in the malls. You get some. You know, they're, they're blasting out uh, Christmas carols. You know, from, from about October. So you know, it's um, it, it's you know, Weird. basically transplanted Western culture, sort of implanted into you know, mall culture, and it's been like that for. You know, ever since I've been here, um, so you know it's it's nothing not, not, not a new thing. 
uh, this hyper commercialization and sort of you know, this, you know, snow scenes and all you know, reindeer and all, all, all the rest of it. Um, American um, uh, carols from, oh, not carols, but the Christmas songs from the 50s and that sort of thing. You know, that, that's what it's like here. It's pretty bizarre. Bizarre. That is that is the word bizarre. I would yeah. just well, say. I mean, going through an me, uh, Indonesian yeah. shopping mall with the reindeers jingling. Yeah. I would think that mm -hmm. is that is well, bizarre. Yeah. It wouldn't be so bad if it didn't. They they literally do start at the end of October. Although I have noticed in the past couple of years that stopped. I think they got the word from the government to to to, to cut it out. Uh, but so so they got. They didn't seem to start. To, and it might, might be related to the pandemic. I don't know. Maybe um, yeah, they didn't seem to start until uh, you know late November or something. So yeah, but it is it is bizarre. I mean, it's bizarre for me just as a you know as a as a Westerner. Um, so, but uh, even more so in Indonesia, where it's simply not simply irrelevant. How is the effects of the pandemic with you? Mm, well, well, in terms of uh, business, I mean, obviously, you know, there's been a huge impact just because um, no one's coming to Indonesia anymore. You know, investors usually want to come to the country they're investing in. And if they can't do that, then they don't invest. So, uh, you know, there is that problem. <laughs> Uh, but but you know I've still got you know many many other clients who are you know still going you know, existing companies that are, you know, still need their usual accountancy and other support services so, so that's that's keeping us alive so it's, it's not you know, that I have stabilised that uh, to a degree so yeah but in terms of uh, you know people every day i mean there's still lockdowns and uh, uh restrictions ah. on movement um but uh, you know I, I think um and the actual numbers of people dying uh seems to be you know going down but the number of people getting sick is probably going up that that's my impression anyway So, so yeah, it's, it's having an impact. Yes, it's uh, you know, it's just everywhere. You can't really do 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 anything without having that in mind. So how and are is, things in is England? that is that uh, the Omicron with you as well? With, yeah, in in Indonesia oh, now, yeah. is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. In, yeah. Hmm. And that, that, I mean, they're saying it's supposed to be milder, you know, mm. which is hard to know what that means. Um, but uh, you know, people are still dying, nonetheless. And you know, people can die quite quickly. You know, so it's, it's uh, it can uh, probably know or know of maybe half a dozen people who have died, you know, um, including. You know, uh, people who you know, come to my office. I had this guy come to my office a few months ago. Um, he often comes here to drop stuff off. Um, he just drops it in, signs off, goes. And uh, he's, he's known to, to one of my employees as well. And he came to my office one day. He, he was sick. And I was wondering, what the hell are you doing here? You know, why are you out doing career stuff? Um, and two days later, he was dead. You no, know? so it can happen extremely quickly. Mm. And that, that was from COVID. But he, he was just found in his room. You no, know? so a lot of people never make it to the hospital. Not that it would do it much good here. So. Mm. That's pretty shocking. Mm. Well, yeah, going from sort of someone who can sort of you know, stand up and sort of function to dead in two days, it's, you know, that's quick. Mm -hmm. 
and it must be in a, in, a, in a, maybe in in a country like Indonesia so much more impact in it, it might be the breadwinner who gets lost there uh, and then the whole mm -hmm. family is is um, oh, that, that, that happens frequently. stranded yeah but, but, but I think you know Indonesians are, are more used to death than, than Western countries you know it happens a lot more often um, the, the uh, I was just thinking um, I can't recall exactly how many but just just my employees alone over the past uh, 25 years or something um, there's been probably about you know maybe eight nine have died you know, and these are you know these aren't the old people you know these, these are you know, relatively young people. You know, things like tuberculosis, you know, which you never see, you know, in the West, um, it's quite common, and uh, people, you know, they might get treatment or they might not get treatment. It's, it's pretty patchy, uh, but of course, in the meantime, they're sort of you know circulating and uh, you know potentially spreading it. So, so, but, but yeah, and, and I mean, just just the. Just, you know, the, the average lifespan of the, in the Indonesian is, you know, 65 is usually, you know, you know that, that's people dying at 65, people aren't surprised. You know, it's just not, it's not a, you know, something that's, um, yeah, so, so in, and in a, a dying of, you know, heart attacks or whatever, you know, 40 or 50 is, you know, really common. Uh, but then so so is diabetes. You know? Probably the, the, the biggest killer in Indonesia is sugar, um, followed by other carbohydrates, rice and what, what have you. So the, the level of diabetes here is, is, uh, is extremely high and all attributable to, to, to the diet, which is you know, basically uh, high sugar, high car carbohydrate. Uh, so, so yes, Indone I think Indonesians are probably more used to death, and uh, you know, or, or see it far more often um, than uh, uh, most Westerners, I'd say. It's a bit heavy, isn't it? Yeah, but that's reality. It's just you know, really the way that's the way it is. Um, mm. Yeah, plus, plus, you know, you've also got this um, mindset, you know, uh, probably reinforced by um, Islam that, you know, well, it was God's will. You know, it happened because it happened because it was his time. Um, you know, that, that sort of attitude. And it even reflects in the way people drive, you know, but that they'll take some, you know, incredible, you know, suicidal uh, maneuvers. Uh, and you know, barely miss getting getting killed, and you think, "Why? Well, he's probably learned his lesson now." But oh no, he'll just say, "Well, I, that was good. I, you know, I got out of that." You know, and that they forgot about they forgot about it in another couple of seconds. You know, they say, "Well, you know, it obviously wasn't my time. You know, God didn't fill it." That is the attitude. So it's, isn't, that, um, isn't that funny? I mean, that seems to be so even in the times when maybe plagues and all that. And, and, and it, I didn't know. Let's say I just heard a program about um, the little ice uh, age uh, that was around the beginning of 1600s. There was a oh. little ice age yeah. when crops failed and uh, the Temp average temperatures in Western Europe dropped significantly, mm. and uh, it had they, they, there's the argument that it made these huge changes that were um, you know led to the Enlightenment movement and all that. So that was the beginning of it. And the the thing, the argumentation of the people was first when their crops failed and and everything just froze up. Um, they were saying, okay, uh, we have sinned, right? God doesn't mm -hmm. like us, I know, he wants to punish us, and we got to mend our ways. And so there was mm -hmm. a huge religious movement first of mend, you know, encouragement to be, lead a better life, be a better Christian, to uh, appease God. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then God didn't seem to bother. So um, that was then the beginning of, well, maybe we need to look elsewhere for salvation. How about <laughs> science? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know how, 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 let's find out a bit more of, of how it all works with nature and what we can do. So mm -hmm. the, the movement is from, uh, you know, going into uh, the dialogue with God, really seeing what can be negotiated. And then if you don't come to the right solution, you give up on him. Uh, you know, you just say, okay, uh, that's clearly not your department. You're not interested. We go elsewhere. <laughs> but this is so yeah. different from, well, it was God's will, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, what do you think? <laughs> well, there is an attitude within, well, in particular in, in Chinese, um, where the, they think, you know, if they become religious, they think, you know, you know that that God does deal. You know, um, and, and you might it sounds ridiculous, but but that is truly the, the the way that they think. They think, you know, if I do this, this, and that, God will be happy, and I'll get this, this, and this. Uh, you know, it's very very transactional sort of um, uh, attitude uh, toward towards uh, religion. Um, more so in Ch in Chinese than. Um, than others, uh, the, the Islamists, uh, it was, Muslims are more resigned. You know, it happens because it happens, and that's all. That, you know, mm. and I, that's what I mean. You know, yeah. that, 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 that so much it seems. You know, that's I'm sure they're not doing it in any way any justice, but just from mm. from this thing, it looks such a you know so much more passive okay whatever comes my way that's just how it is to to this christian attitude also and i need to negotiate here yes, and yes. and um if it doesn't work out you know i'm out of here basically mm -hmm. yes. so it it is it, uh, it is very different mm -hmm. yeah Rupert, I'm, what I'm, do you think? I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about this um, argument, really. I, I suspect. I suspect there are lots of other reasons for the uh, enlightenment, and I, I can't say it. But I mean, I think if you look at things like the way the political divide has become more evident now than it was say when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s that politics it was it was often the case you would say politics that there was no difference between the leaders doesn't matter who you whether it was Harold Wilson or Edward Heath and it only really started to become different under Thatcher and then there was a big political divide and I, I can see parallels in that now with things like Brexit and Trumpism and you can see tribes emerging that were always there, probably. And I think that's very similar to religion. And the religion of Brexiteers is not God, but uh, the nation state of Britain, and they, or the UK, or England, or whatever. And they, they identify with that, and that's where truth lies. Truth lies in Britain. And it doesn't matter the fact that, that you can present a lot of evidence logic rationality and saying well this is a big mistake it's actually you're going to be worse off it doesn't that doesn't matter the truth lies with a nation state or god and i and i think that when i used to live when i used to live in 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 botswana the it was the time of aids and huge numbers of people were dying of aids I and mean, it was just remarkable how it decimated the population but nobody died of aids everybody was dying of witchcraft um and you just even the little big billboards up and because that wasn't what people believed in they believed in witchcraft they didn't believe in in science or most most people because because most people weren't very well educated and mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's, to me, is really where it, it lies, where the problem lies. It's if you get a lot of 
people with very poor levels of education, um, then they will want to have something that's easy to believe or something that's not maybe easy to believe, but something that's acceptable and within their remit to believe. And like that nation, nation states, the, 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 uh, the, something that you can identify with, something that you've grown up with, something you think is has truth within it, then I, I can accept that because that's something that was it within my remit. And you know, the God is good is a very straightforward um, thing to accept. And uh, you know, if you don't have much education, it's also logical. I mean, it's well, difficult. It's, there's a problem there. I mean, you, you say it's because of, you know, they're not educated or they don't have, they haven't had an education. Um, but I, I see that, you know, even with uh, uh, people in some societies who have had an education, they will still revert to, to, to these uh, you know, metaphysical beliefs or, or, you know, beliefs of whatever sort within them uh, in preference to, to, to reason and, and logic. Um, you see that, uh, well, I've seen it directly myself. Um, in, in Indonesia on a number of occasions. Um, well, I, I give you one, one example, and that is um, I, was, I was having to, to, to take someone, well, someone had um, fallen ill. It was some sort of, I mean, from what I, I could gather, some sort of schizoid ep episode. You know, she, um, she, she had become quite uh, psychotic um, and you know, I've seen this a few times, so it, it did. You know, I did recognise it as being some sort of psychosis. So I took her to a, um, um, a psychiatric, well, what they call the psychiatric hospital here in well, there in Jakarta. And uh, first of all, that there was there was no psychiatrists there. I think, I don't know how many psychiatrists there are in Indonesia, there might be two, um, but, you know, and I might not be joking about that. Um, but uh, what I, I, I met with this, this um, well, junior doctor who was, you know, I guess in some way training to become a psychiatrist, I, I really don't know. Uh, but anyway, you know, she, she sat down and uh, um, she spoke to me. She didn't speak to the woman. And she basically said, you know, uh, what's wrong with her? Um, and uh, and I, I just I forget what I'll say. I, I just sort of you know, ex explained that you know, she was seeing all these things and thinking that you know, people were out to get her and that you know, she had all these sort of bizarre sort of um, stories about, you know, you know, well, witches and and whatever, and people doing doing witchcraft and and, and the, the response of this 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 doctor uh, was to say, really, who's doing it? <laughs> and uh, well, and and she was quite serious. She 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 thought, oh yeah, this is sound tech. You know, this is the black magic stuff. You know, this is this is definitely. No, no, I sort of immediately thought, have I got a patient or a doctor here? You know, <laughs> I truly thought, that. you know, who is this person? You know, she just sort of co went completely off, sort of, you know, saying, trying to sort of find out, you know, maybe, you know, the, the source of this uh, black magic and uh, uh, who could have been responsible for it. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. And, you know, didn't see her at all, didn't actually speak to her with the, with the woman at all. Um, it, it was basically my problem, I guess, that you know, I perceived that she had a problem. It was quite clearly psychotic and, and very ill. Um, and, and there was nothing I could do. There was no point leaving her there, absolutely no point at all. Um, and, and so yeah, that, that was, that was a, you know, an educated doctor so-called, 
um, training to be a psychiatrist, I presume, um, who, who was completely, well, not, not accepting, but not only accepting of, you know, black magic, but sort of, you know, trying to find the source of the black magic. Um, you know, and, and it wasn't just her trying to sort of find out maybe there was sort of some sort of backstory going on or other stuff happening. You know, this woman was in a, psych, a clearly psychotic state. You know, it, it was nothing to do with magic. She was, she was sick. Um, and, and, and they just couldn't see that. And, and another case, and it's just, well, I expect there's quite a few of them, but another clear case is uh, a woman who educated, uh, you know, university educated. Um, um, and she contracted cancer. And just and uh, you know she got a diagnosis and at the state at the time she got a diagnosis it was um, um, what do they call it um, it's a, it's, they call it stadium three um, third sta I think the third stage cancer so yeah pretty damn serious basically uh, so you know she got a diagnosis from from somebody who I thought was seem to be vaguely competent as specialists. Um, so, you know, there was no ambiguity that, you know, from what the information that I got, uh, that, you know, she was, um, you know, seriously ill. And so, so the first thing she did was basically run away to her car form and get her mother to sort of treat her with herbal treatments. Uh, you know, so, so she all sorts of things and, and lighting, lighting sort of these little incense piles and things like that. And, and, and this and sort of this must have went on for, for many, many months. And by the time, you know, I guess she realized that, you know, these, and, and this was all supported by her family. She basically went back to her mother and they were sort of right into this, you know, sunset, uh, black magic and, uh, um, you know, all sorts of metaphysical stuff, you know, very deeply into it. And uh, I, I, by, the st by the time that, you know, she realized that it wasn't going to work, it was way, way too late. Um, and, and that happens all the time, that sort of thing, where, where, you know, seemingly educated people who you think should know better um, don't. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I'm. I have no uh, argument against that. I, well, I'm. I'm. I think it's when you said seemingly. That's the word because that <laughs> clearly you've got a, a you've got a, a a psychiatrist who believes in black magic. Then you 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 wonder about the level of education as a in psychiatry. Well, even well, you. you... I used to tutor um, uh, medical students in Chongkakata, and I can tell you that you know it, it, it was pretty appalling. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's improved since that. You know, this is going back you know, 25 or more years, uh, but uh, even so, um, you know, you talk, when you're talking about third-year medical students, you do expect them to have some you know, basic anatomy and physiology. Um, they didn't have even that. And, uh, and, and, and they're still into this. You know, and a lot of doctors are you know, very religious, um, which, which in itself is, you know, for me, a, always a red flag. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's just my prejudice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it certainly didn't inspire you with confidence. Um, the, the learning that was done was not was, was largely symbolic. It was, you know, it wasn't sort of about you know, this isn't about the real world. This is just what we have to learn in order to sort of get our our, our doctor title. So, you know, it was, and of course, I, I, I went to Indonesian University, of course. So, you know, I I, I know how bad it is. So. Well, I, yeah, I, should, well, there we are. I, 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 I think that's supporting my argument that is, you know, if you're a bad education, isn't the same as 
is. I, 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 I'm, I'm not okay. sure if education has well, anything to do with it because mm. it's isn't it like it looks to me if, and I see that in educated or non-educated people in my patients or they when when you are under stress so like you have a very bad news uh, or uh, like cancer or something then um that it, it isn't your rational brain that sorts that out and tells you how to get out of this it's it's a, a much more holistic picture of beliefs what mm. is good for you that might have much more to do with what got handed down from your family what mm. are the family beliefs uh, so it, it it taps into a feeling what is right for me to get better which mm. has nothing to do with science or med modern medicine or anything how can i get out of this very uh, tough space will will tap into a, f a feeling of what is good for me and that might well be my mum rocking me and singing lullabies you know, in that, that that kind of thing you know it 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 immediately goes into a feeling thing like mm -hmm. rushing to your family uh, out of the medical ward rushing to your family and let them burn mm -hmm. the incense my, will make much more sense because that's where the wholesomeness lies and that and and the the, the structures that make that decision are uh, being in the world structures not uh, rational very dis, you know specific scientific um um, mm -hmm. stuff isn't it it's mm -hmm. how to be in the world gets gets asked and that might have a lot to do with incense and family and um and so all that kicks in and it can override the rational stuff you know clearly mm -hmm. when when this when the psychiatrist heard about uh, all these evidence for 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 being for being uh, haunted you know being bewitched that that just fitted into that mm -hmm. wholeness of belief system so much so it overrid right? everything else. It's, yeah. It is, but it, it's phenomenal when it happens. You know, like in that's a particularly stark uh, example. But on a smaller sense, I see that happening all the time. That p people that it's a luxury that rational. Uh, you know, kind of um, statistical br brain is a luxury, isn't it? It is not what m most people would um, draw on when they find themselves in a tough spot. Mm. Now, we see that with the vaccination programs here and all that. You know, this, that it, it, it taps into something that is much more traditional or what was the, what was the general feeling uh, um, uh, how do I, how much do I trust science or doctors or and, and of the family? It, it, it's it's getting decided elsewhere, really not in that very specific uh, frontal people, lobe thing. <laughs> most people get vaccinated in in Britain. Most in most people in Europe get vaccinated. Even in America, most people get vaccinated. Yeah. I mean, why would they get vaccinated? Why, why, why do the ones that don't not get vaccinated? Well, but that my point is that they are a minority, and in Indonesia, an area, a country with less levels of education, it the perhaps is not the case. It's it. I, if it isn't education, what else is it? If it isn't education, why? I are, think no. I think it's education several generations down. Oh, maybe. absolutely. Oh, no, I'm not just saying. You know, so that the yeah. tradition of the family is already oriented towards oh, educated yeah. and uh, and scientific rather than that's only happened to you. And now something bad happens and the whole system taps into the family stuff. You know, what has been handed down, how we do such things. And uh, yeah. yeah, but I, all it's all I'm saying. This is it's not it's not it's not being a human that makes you like that. It's culture that makes you like that. Oh and yeah, it's, so, and it's the culture over time. So when I was in Botswana and I was working there as a as a in in education, and and I was teaching the first generation 
who have ever, who had had any education and what we would consider education any any level of formal education so obviously when they were going back home there was no support for that because nobody in the, any previous generation had any level of education at all and, and it would obviously take you could see it was obviously going to take a long time for things to to permeate through um, I, so that especially that's, that's yeah straightforward especially but, but if it, you don't it, educate the mothers like you don't mm -hmm. educate the girls yeah. it yeah. never happens does it yeah. because no, i think absolutely. because of 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 this they if they if they will tell their children because they're not educated that it is witchcraft then you've got another yeah another generation which will believe that much more than any science that comes later on i think the the, the really unfortunate thing is that it's this you tend to throw out throw the baby out with the bathwater because if you if you have everything as a as a a western type of education then you'd lose what you had mentioned before about the sort of holistic view of the world and being that we this we we create through our education we create or reinforce this idea of dualism of of us being separate from the world and so we we move very much in one direction and mm. so we have a an idea of of medicine as being very mechanical or generally speaking as being a as something because that's what it happens when you divorce um r the reason from the world from existing in the world and and I, and really what we want is a, a compromise you know the acceptance of being in the world but also an acceptance of of rationality not as a belief system because i mean it's interesting because the word belief what we believe in is i was reading about this a, a while ago and i, I may have mentioned it before but i, I I read a guy and he said the best thing is when people ask him what he believes in, he says, well, actually, it's what I have confidence in is a better way of saying it. Because belief is associated with things like faith and la di da and But if, if, you, if you, instead you say, well, I have confidence in this, so I have confidence in God, then it's possible to have confidence in something else. You can think, well, at the moment I have confidence in this. So you can have confidence in science and it's until I have confidence in the vaccines until they're shown not to work. And going back to what you were saying earlier, Alfie, about the sort of the mini ice age, then perhaps, you know, there is a case there to say, well, we have confidence in God until it's no longer valid. Hmm. So it's not necessarily, and, I, and it's a, it's a nice, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a better way of thinking about the concept of belief um, because it, it sort of suggests that there is a possibility for change because sometimes if you sort of say well i believe in something else well i could never move from that but if you have at the moment i've got confidence in this as a system that works but but it, i do but i mean the good thing about science is that you can never have ultimate confidence you, you can only have, you can only, as a scientist, you can only say it says I have confidence in it at the moment for the evidence I have at the moment. Once that evidence changes, if it changes, then I, my confidence will change. That was Brian Green. I couldn't remember his name. It was him I read who said that. That's good. It's another, I've been reading a very interesting book. I'll, um, I'll go and get it because I can't remember. I can't remember what it's called. I can't remember the name. Uh, memory, eh? Um, and, but I can remember what it's about. It's because it's about the nature of feeling um, from a scientific perspective. And the one thing I was reading just recently is the difference in um types of emotion that we have and he he's 
his his evidence seems to be suggesting that there is you get a different emotion from pain that and you do from evidence from the from the senses generally so the so there are sort of two different types of emotion and because they 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 come from stimulus chemical stimulus in the brains in different areas and I, I just thought it was because he talks a lot I mean, the whole thing is about sort of emotions and where they come from from a from a chemical and electrical perspective in the brain where where are these places and i'm only a third of the way through so i don't know quite where it's what the, what the conclusions are going to be but i thought that was it was quite interesting to think that although we i mean i can't see when i feel an emotion i can't identify necessarily the source of that emotion but what he's saying is they're clearly different sources and though we might think of what we're feeling at the end as being homogenous always the similar it's not it actually comes from different places and that made me think about another book that i was reading which i can't remember because it's just over here called the history of emotion which was suggesting that emotions have been it's a whole sort of new area of of investigation because only over the last sort of 20 years or so it's it's become something that people looked at but it's it's looking at how people felt in different times in history which is obviously quite a difficult thing to do to work mm -hmm. out but it does relate to this idea of people in different cultures today thinking as Gary was saying about death you know if you think of people in Victorian England for instance accepting um, child deaths or deaths in, in, or in, in birth it was sort of it was very common that the children would die during uh, the birth or mothers would die during birth and mm. and you think so was the impact of losing a child then emotionally the same as it would be now when it's it's a very rare occurrence and i i used to think well no they got okay, sort of like if you're used to something then you're you will you will perceive it you will feel it differently <laughs> that's my coffee <laughs> hello <laughs> there are very good uh, habits and <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, um i'll just see if i can see that book uh i'll i'll find it i'll get the other one as well but i want to go get it um okay i'll hang on Well, I always think that emotion is like, um, you know, the, the main thing is about orientating us towards some particular action. So if um, the death of a child is embedded into a completely different culture, the action following would be different. Can we say that again? Do you see it again? Oh, okay, hang on, let's get the other one. So, uh, another one <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must put books in the right order and then I'll be able to find them oh there it is so that's that one but that's the one that I was I didn't get all the way through because I, I lost the argument a bit really mm -hmm. it, it's it's a big so sort of, quite a long book that doesn't really say a great deal sort of says the same arguments it's because he's what he's doing he's presenting this idea that emotions that there there is there is a um a field of investigation which is the history of emotions so you can study it that's what it, the premise is that you could do that and he's saying well some people don't think that's true and some people do think it's true and i think it is true and that's really mm -hmm. the book um, so you don't have to read that one um, but this one, the uh, Antonio 
Damasio, the feeling of what happens. The feeling that must be happens. quite old, Damasio, no? Damasio, yeah, it's about 20 years old, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's, it's, it's reasoned enough to have things like CCT, CT scans. What are they called? CT scans? CT scans. Yeah. 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 So that he's, so that the evidence is, is such that it's, it's, it's coming from as, as, as good a, uh, a, a scientific base, I suppose, as you could hope. Um, as well as doing a lot, of, as, as well as just sort of general um, observation of of people, but it's he has some very interesting. Um, I don't know. Have you come across that book? Too? Not that particular. No, me neither. No. no. It seems to be quite. There seems to be quite a lot of um, interesting things that he's pulled together in, in it. I've, I've made quite a lot of notes as I'm sort of going through. Because I was, the main reason I was looking at these things was because of my interest in, in, in creativity. And he doesn't, he's not, well, he might touch on it, but that, I, I can see things, how things are sort of running in parallel. Um, you get sort of get a sense of this emotion and how emotions are created and the effect that they have, the whole body effect that they have on us, and how, as you were saying, that you know that they, they are overriding how we feel can be the overriding sense of what it is to exist, but it doesn't have to be. There can be other ways of seeing the world which is not i guess a feeling based so if it's if i if i think it's a good idea to get vaccinated if i think it's a good idea to wear a mask then those things are not because i feel the, the feel i mean i don't you know, i don't feel better by getting vaccinated i don't feel better by wearing a mask so i'm doing things i'm acting not based on feeling but based on something else which isn't a it's not giving me any any satisfaction i don't get any comfort from it but i think it's probably the right thing the sensible thing to do like wearing a seatbelt you know it's a it's it's a it's not feeling based it's not emotionally based see i would argue with that ah good Excellent. It would be pointless <laughs> coming along if you didn't. <laughs> no, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say that you, that you that you um, you know you think it through once or twice, but then it goes into that holistic, very feeling based um, realm where it just feels right to put your seatbelt on. It feels right to um, put a mask on. It then it's not. It's it. You know, it's in this almost like habit world where, but that is much more feeling driven than thinking driven. Mm -hmm. I don't think that through anymore. I, I think I, th I think it through maybe once. I hear listen to an argument. It makes sense to me. I decide on that in this way of wearing a mask or so and then i forever more do it because it has it it feels right to do that so i get and and feeling in the way of not a big emotion of happiness but a, a, um, a subtler feeling of i get a reward when i do that i put the mask on i get a re little reward of that feels right just that. So it's a little, tiny little thing, not, not um, you know, I'm not um, uh, jumping around for joy, but it does. 
I, I feel that when you really look into that, you, you can feel the little pang of feeling that that little, little thing of that feels right. I'm doing the right thing. I feel righteous. You know, I feel something that keep, gets me through doing it every day, not the thinking about it. I, I would argue. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I really don't like wearing masks. I find them quite uncomfortable. So I, and I find my breathing is difficult. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of aware that this is unpleasant. It is. You know what they do? They just on a on a side side effect. They make us mouth breathe. You put a mask on. Watch yourself. Uh, you will start mouth breathing very quickly, and mouth breathing is a seriously bad habit and doesn't make us feel good it immediately makes us feel bad uh, if you normally you know some people a few poor poor people uh, do that all the time and feel bad all the time without knowing why but it is um, physiologically a big number um, and I think that has a lot to do why people hate masks and why we feel not well with it but isn't that the opposite of what you were saying that I feel better that I feel good about it well I don't I don't feel good I feel bad I feel uncomfortable you and feel uncomfortable same. physically but you feel right you know emotionally you feel you're doing the right thing that's not a thought thing that's a feeling thing that's what I mean well isn't feeling uncomfortable a feeling thing well, feeling um, uncomfortable is it could be a, a part of social acceptability as well. You, you know, you, mm -hmm. you're, you you wear the mask because it's, it's uh, um, expected socially that you do that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, feel, I wear a mask because That's a I think feeling thing. <laughs> I think it's probably a good idea to stop me getting a virus mm -hmm. and stop and giving it to other people if I had it. Mm -hmm. So that, but that, I, that's why I do it. I don't do it because I think it's, because I feel good, because I don't feel good. That's why I'm, I'm not, don't I feel righteous? I don't feel righteous. And, and I don't like wearing a seatbelt. I mean, it's silly. I mean, um, and I, I always, pretty much always drive off without putting a seatbelt. And it, because the thing makes a noise, I put the seatbelt. And Lynn gets very cross because she shouldn't put the seatbelt on while I'm driving. Stop, put the seatbelt on, but then drive. Look, you always got to put it on. That <laughs> must be a male thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think it's because I learned to drive without using a seatbelt. Without a seatbelt, it's something that's happened later. Yeah. And I, if I'd learned to drive with a seatbelt, I probably would. It would be auto. It would become automatic. But it's never become a habit for me. And, I, and, I, and it doesn't make me feel good. I don't know. So I'm not sure. But I know that it's the right thing to do, and I know it's sensible to do. But so I why do you it. do it? I do you think it. it through every time? Yeah. Well, I can't drive the car without it, mm -hmm. and I know it makes it's a illegal. noise. <laughs> it makes a noise. I know it's illegal, and I know it's a sensible thing to do. So yes, I mean I do, it. but I don't. I, I can't think that it makes me feel right or righteous or there's a, an emotional aspect to it. See, maybe I would is, say that it, you feel bad with a mask on is a physiological feeling bad. That's not emotional. I don't well, think you feel where, emotionally that's, bad. That's what he says. He says ah. that it is. He hmm. says that the pain, like it's not, not much of a pain, but he says that does create emotions. It's just that those emotions are not the same. Well, they don't come from the same place as the emotions that come from something that you might hear said something nasty about you or, you, or something like that. so you feel bad so the emotion has come from somewhere else rather than a direct physiological effect anyway i'll i'll read more and, and let you know because i, it, I it's it's I, it's something i have not come across before and i um so i'm quite sort of interested in, in it as a uh, 
I'm interested that we use the same word in any language yeah. I know yeah. uh, for feeling, for feeling yeah. hatred uh, and feeling uncomfortable behind a mask. I, I find that very interesting that we use the same word yeah. because you could make a very good argument and completely different things. Absolutely. But, I, but we describe it as one. And I think it's because um, it is in that realm of where uh, it makes us do things. It it orientates us. So emotion. So it leads to deed, to to action, mo uh, 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 a physical movement towards it or against it. So there we are with the feeling tones again. This orientation towards pleasure, non pleasure, or not interesting, and where we go with that. So feeling tone. I think gets it quite right in orientating towards uh, either rejection or having it. And then it is a, quite a complex computation seems to go on there. What wins? Like with wearing the mask, there's a physiological uncomfortableness about it. My body says, I don't want this. Um, and then there is a, a, a drained up thing. It's, I think it's good for me. Uh, how can we make that work so that it feels right? It feels right to wear the mask, overriding the feeling not right of wearing a mask. So it's it's quite finely tuned there, and they they are different sources of information, and they get get into the black box of feeling, and it comes out. You either wear the mask or you don't. It's interesting. I've just reminded me of another thing I've just read in that. And he says that pain and pleasure are not on the same scale. He says they come from different places. He says pain is one thing and pleasure is something else. And that we think of them as being a, a sort of continuum and, and the feeling tone thing, which is I actually wrote it in the margin last night. Because I said, because what he's saying is that that isn't the case. Is that is that is that although we see it that way, they are actually are coming from very different things. So pain comes from one source, and you have levels of pain, and pleasure comes from a completely different source, and you have levels of pleasure. But there is nothing where you have pleasure and pain in one continuum. They're, I would they are, agree. Yeah, they're, they're distinct. They're, totally, they're aren't they? So they're not opposites. No. So one is not no. the opposite to the other, and no. that there isn't a continuum. There is just no. this level as of pleasure, mm. and there's this level of pain, but they are yeah. separate. Yeah. Which would which would mean that the feeling tone thing is not that they won't. There isn't a place in the middle, you know, where no. they pass. No. There is either you've got pleasure or you have pain, because yeah. I think a lot of the time, I don't have anything. I don't feel you know, particular pleasure. I don't feel particular pain. It's just, that's just as things are. They're just, I don't know whether I call it equilibrium, but there's, there's just life. There's neither one thing or the other. And I, and I, you know, I, so I always, that thing about the, the, is it Vedana, the, the, the idea of the, where you have this spectrum of, of feeling. I've always thought it was a bit weird because that never really made sense to me. But I can understand when I've, you know, things are painful and I know those situations, like Gary was saying right at the very beginning, you know, yes, there are times where you feel down, and, you know, you feel this is all very uncomfortable. And there are times when you think, oh, this is nice, and this is all very light. But most of the time it isn't either for me. It's just, it's just there, that's just existing. And that would be that, that life is not driven then by emotions. And maybe that's the time when you are more susceptible to being rational. Anyway, I don't know. Well, they, they may well be different uh, characteristics or qualities, but uh, that would not prevent one from affecting the other in some way. Well, even if they're on different continuums.
well a lack of pain might help to for pleasure but the point the point he's making is that the pain is pain and is levels of uncomfortness and, and levels of suffering but it's not it's not ever going to be something that can provide you pleasure that, that can provide levels of happiness or that that comes from a different source and and if you haven't got much happiness then you get to a to a sort of a state where that's just okay well i'm i'm just ex this i suppose that's what i'm thinking that's well i'm just existing so if i've not got a pain then i'm ex just existing i haven't got a pleasure i'm just existing so i'm just i'm just existing without either i'm just it's just there i mean at the moment it's nice to see you so slight levels of you know pleasure there i'm mm -hmm. and, and when the fire goes on poor oh, nice a bit warmer because it's incredibly cold outside although it's incredibly bright so you know but i'm not it's at the moment i wouldn't have said that there is you know on a, on either spectrum there's any there's much fluctuation on the needle and it's just that's just okay it's all right it's just but it's not it's not great it's not it's not suffering But maybe that's just me. No, I think it is. And it, 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 it makes sense. I mean, Damasio is a neuroscientist, so he comes just from the physiology. He says these yeah. are completely different parts of the brain that get engaged in pain and ple pleasure. So different pathways. Uh, they don't cross over. There's that it doesn't come out of the same kind of area and, and goes swings like the needle. Um, and and that is the is not the experience of what well, most people have this feeling of unity about themselves or that they should have unity. And when you look at the brain and how it processes things, for example, this, you pretty much, you know, immediately it becomes apparent that you can have many, many different experiences at the in parallel because there's all these different um, areas that do their own thing and come to up with their own computation and then your this integration into one whole happens more or less well uh, if you if you really look and I think that's what meditation and you know why why is that quite a good thing to get to know yourself because you can actually then find the different voices there the different uh, rather than you, you become much clearer and more used to the idea that there's always several different things going on you know there's a bit of pain about that but at the same time a bit pleasure about that the two, two don't don't meet but they they can be there and it doesn't make any sense necessarily we can be very controversial you know i don't like what Boris does at the moment, but I will vote for him again. So, I mean, it is, it, it is, it's never, hardly ever really integrated as an experience. I think the integrated point comes pretty much, well, I propose that to you, in this neutral area of equilibrium, nothing painful, nothing enthusiastic, in that middle bit, well, we call it, I call it middle bit, and I apologize because it's not the middle, it's not in the middle of the two, it's a separate realm. I agree with that. It's not a continuum, it's three different states. They, they have their, each their continuum. And so if I'm bang in the middle of equilibrium and it's, the others don't pipe up much, then I have half a chance of being in flow, which is very pleasant in that own way. Um, but nothing of that, um, it, it's not a big emotion. It's, it's, a, it's a, a neutral state that lets me engage with the world best, creatively, I would say. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe, I mean, I, it's, it's certainly interesting to think that if you're in pain, it's difficult to be creative. If you're in 
the high levels of pleasure, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it yet. But it's, it's, it's very, the other interesting thing at the beginning of the book, I mean, which is probably what the whole thing is, yeah, it's really going to come back to in the end, is that, is that consciousness, he says, um, comes from the noticing of feeling. Um, he says that the thing about the us is that we notice we have feelings. And he said, as soon as that happened, or in evolution, you note that there is noticing that there has to be something that does the noticing and that's where that's where conscious the, the self comes from the idea of a self came from there has to be something watching the pictures if there are pictures if you notice that you're feeling good or feeling bad then the word you has just been invented so there has to be something that does it. And that, he says, is the self. <clears throat> so consciousness creates the self because you can't exist without it. It's something has to notice. Um, <clears throat> which is quite an interesting way of looking at the nature of where self came from. But also it, it sort of reinforces this idea of the self as being an invented thing. as something that, that, that doesn't exist externally um, as a, an, an entity but something that is a process uh, which is also quite interesting uh, and again when you say when you go into the sort of like the areas of flow where it's less noticeable that there is a a self perhaps because when you're in the flow you're not noticing or there is not something else that's noticing it's just there you things are happening it's not something that is watching something happening so there's a diminishing of the of the self at that stage mm. because it's not so necessary can i read you something because i just there's this there is this um uh, documentary about tom stoppard that's i say anything oh, to you gary yeah, yeah as a playwright tom stoppard he's a playwright british playwright very well known and there's a documentary <clears throat> and and so alan yento asks him this well-known cultural interviewer um how how the writing comes on him you know how are you creative and he says well i had this experience and um, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing this but then he said this tipped me over this experience from believing i had to know everything about it before i could write it to believing the less i knew the better and if you feel clever when you have finished, it's probably no good. If you feel lucky when you've finished, it might be good. Describing, I'm, I'm just at a moment at this creativity kind of almost, you know, I'm, I'm collecting because it things like that speak to me because it's always like that. I call it percolation. You know, if you set a task and then you live your life and it come, you, you, you spot it that you wouldn't would have otherwise overlooked because you have always half a radar out for it. But it seems to me that it's quite right that it is that I think that makes a lot of sense I mean that idea of cleverness as being related to creativity is just yeah it's not it's not no that's belongs... imaginative clever I think is imaginative you know you can imagine this and that to happen you plot it all out you have storylines la 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 yeah. but yeah. it won't make it good um, no. you kind of have to all be so so in the flow that you surprise yourself you don't you don't know it you didn't see it coming but you and you feel lucky that it came your way i'd like that yeah yeah and i think also it's that that yourself that the fact that it's not yourself that it's not you that's doing it it's not self that's doing it 
that it has got nothing to do with self. It's got nothing to do with, it can't be. I mean, that's the point. It's again, it's the, when the self, which is this sort of illusionary thing, isn't there, then it gives an, an opportunity for creativity. If you have a self, you can't be creative because there's an ego that's driving it. And that's just nonsense. That's just cannot be part of it. <clears throat> That must be even so when you write code, Gary, tell me, is that mm -hmm. is that a creative, would that be totally, um, totally. applicable? Totally? Oh, totally. Oh, so look. It's, it's that you need to be in flow and you could be in there for weeks. So, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, timelessness, effortlessness, selflessness, uh, you know, that's those are all the qualities of, of flow and that's exactly what happens when you're programming um wow. you know, yourself just disappears it's not there anymore um there's no ego in coding <laughs> um and, and of course there's imagination you've got, you've got to think you know how could algorithm be better better and you know programmers are always thinking that always thinking how can i squeeze a little you know, a few little nanoseconds out of this algorithm you know, it's obsessive. Um, you, know, you might spend a whole day trying to sort of, you know, squeeze a, a few, you know, nanoseconds of optimization out of a, a piece of code, not because it's going to make any difference, but because, you know, well, I, I won't call it pride. It's more like workmanship. You know, you've got you, you, it's craft. You know, it's it's not just about you know functioning, which which it has to be too. It's about the the artistry of that of that uh, work. You, know? mm -hmm. you can go back to that code and say, "Oh, that's beautiful. That's you know, really nice code." Or you can go back to another piece of code and just say, "What the hell was I thinking?" Um, and I, I can go back to code that I did two weeks ago, and I've got no idea what the hell I was doing, or how the hell that the program works. Um, you can very very quickly, you know, it, because you can be, be so intensely into the into an algorithm. Or, or into a particular script or program, um, that you know you, you'll know every every inch of it. But you know, come a few months' time, and you've got no idea. Well, if if it's not well crafted, um, you can get completely lost, and you can't really you know it can take a great deal of effort to try and figure out what the hell was uh, happening there, and uh, you know how to fix it or how to make it better. So, oh yeah, so, so it's, it's uh, flow is, is uh, you know, or, or creativity. It, it, it's uh, an essential part of the program. That's very interesting. You said workmanship. There's a there's a book which I I studied as part of my undergraduate degree called "The Nature and Art of Workmanship" by a guy called David Pye, and I. When I was doing something just not long ago, it made me realize, I think when I was thinking about this creativity thing, I thought that's a really good book. I should go and get it again. And I, and I ordered it, but I ordered the wrong one because he did another one called The Nature and Art of Something Else. Mm -hmm. and, and I got that instead because apparently it's, it's quite a difficult book to get hold of now, but I, it's not in print. So I, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I will go and get it because it's a very thin book. But it's very interesting about, as I said, this as a designer, it was when I was on the reading list. And it was, it's about the philosophy of, of uh, workmanship. And he talks yeah. about what it's like to work with materials. Now, we are working with numbers, but I think they're very similar. It's just working with something that's external. And when you are I say in the flow is the modern terminology, but it's when you are completely involved within that, that the, the self disappears and the, the duality disappears and there is existence. Um, and from which, yes, then the, the from which or where within which creativity can happen. I'm not mm -hmm. sure it has to happen, but I'm, I don't know. It's, uh, 
I'll go and get it because it, he's, he's really one of the great things about David Pye, which as a designer is really useful. He's, he says, all designs fail. And, and he said that, you know, all planes or pla planes will fall out of the sky. They weren't designed to do it, but they will. Cars will drive into other cars, kill you. They're not designed to, but they will. Every design. And it's a great thing for, for, to teach design students because, you know, every design fails. Mm. And we can't, you know, it, it's a, it's a, and it's a truism that I've remembered ever since. You know, you, you, it's a, it's a good thing to remember. All designs fail. <laughs> and it's, you tell it to students the first time, and they just, they, they look at you in complete disbelief because obviously that their job is to try and make things that don't fail. That's all. First thing to remember: all designs fail. It's good. But I haven't got that book to show you because I haven't bought it, but I'm going to buy it again. I'm going to try and get it again. They didn't like you for saying that, I bet. <laughs> it's a, it was always started very interesting debates because it, the first time you read it, I, well, the first time I read it, I thought, what? And then, and then you start to read it. I thought, well, I'm a good designer, me. I can design that. I'm good at it. And then, no, you're not. Nobody is a good designer because if you're a good designer, you wouldn't make things that fail, would you? And you think, ah, no. <laughs> and then you read, no, and they do. And yes, everything fails. But, well, everything is in the process of becoming rather than, than, than being. And yeah, when, oh my God, well, that's the other way. I was just saying. You're looking at a piece of code. I mean, how many pieces of code are being run uh, from? Okay, let's say 10 years ago. Very, very few bits of, well, there are, but uh, you know, there's relatively few uh, uh, programs that haven't been completely rewritten. Uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, apart from some sort of very, very specialized computers, I mean, code from, say, you know, 20 or 30 years ago is. It may well have been you know, perfectly designed, perfectly crafted, uh, but it's completely irrelevant now. It was just sort of a part of the process, you know. It, you know, it was uh, ongoing sort of uh, changes to, to technology, to, to programming languages, to, to sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, all sorts of other external fact factors can sort of, you know, contribute to the to the um, uh, evolution of code. So it's always in a state of becoming uh, uh, rather than uh, of being, even though you may have a, you know, a perfect algorithm, you know, ultimately it, it'll be recoded, refactored or something, um, um, it, it, because it's just inevitable. And it's, it's a, that's a great argument against this idea that this, the tyranny of product you know, that, that we have the idea that product is all because product is nothing product is only ever part of the process mm -hmm. can only ever be part of the process mm -hmm. and there is no product that will last mm -hmm. all products fail well, 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 not that that fail that they're transitional uh, i mean some some well, may they... not uh, evolve uh in that other, you know that they may you know ex become extinct because you know uh, the, the conditions are no longer suitable for it, uh, but you know other branches of it will uh, perhaps uh, evolve. Well, it's and, and evolution is quite a nice uh, uh, metaphor for for it because it's the same. It's like that when you're when you're young, I guess you sort of think that that evolution has a result and it's us, mm. as opposed to it being a. We're just part of the process. Mm. We're just where it is at the moment. And it's the same with the cultural thing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not yeah. an ultimate culture. It's just where we happen to be at the moment. Where we happen to be. Mm. The culture I like that a lot. Everything is in a process of becoming. Well, maybe... It's kind of a little less like all designs fail. <laughs> it's very kind of it's more, more positive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's <No>. top ourselves. <laughs> but no. this is like, it has such a 
it has creativity and it has an answer. Oh my God, you know, we just it's just going to keep going in its own sweet way. And that might well be decline and decay. But, you know, then the mm. next fungus will make the most of it. Mm. Won't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very uplifting in that way. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, my, my, the vast majority of species that have ever lived are now dead. Uh, <laughs> yes. you know, their lineages have, have gone. Uh, yeah. So, you know, All designs fail. <laughs> well, but is it or is it just um, you know, you well i don't know if you're dead you're dead so it's a pretty big failure well it's, yeah. it's not really don't because... get any bigger than being dead you know but environments yeah. change and so, and so you know yeah what, absolutely what may, may have been yeah. adaptive in one situation suddenly becomes you know it changes and, and it's no longer adaptive it's maladaptive uh and other lineages then sort of uh rise up and 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 take over and they, they you know obviously they, they'll think the the you know they're the ultimate but but you know, ultimately conditions change and uh, they are just another transition um or another so dead end but yeah. but, that, but maybe it's got something to do with the fact that i'm, I'm rereading you know origin of the species and uh, yeah god knows how many other books and, and like uh to, yeah, I, I guess most of my reading at the moment is related to, to evolution in, in some way or other, um, whether it be cultural evolution or, or biological evolution. Um, uh, but yeah, I've been doing an awful lot of, I think, I think I've gone to an awful lot of books these past couple of months. Um, but what have you been reading, Elfie? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I haven't been reading a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very overworked at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm doing, yeah. everyone has a kind of the January bug, you know, like I'll sort my life out now and they will come out mm. the woodwork and and then I don't read anything. I, and I, it makes me not feel very good. <laughs> well, I, I guess ah, I do. Feeling. <laughs> Most of my reading is actually listening. So, you know, I, I bet when I take some breaks from programming or from you know doing some sort of thing, you know, I'll, I'll sort of just go outside and sort of wander up and down the courtyard listening to to, to books. Uh -huh. so I can go through quite a few books like that. You know, you take sort of you know, you know, a, I don't know, half a dozen twenty-minute breaks every day. You can work through quite a few books like that. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's the same with me. Like, audio books are my main source. Mm -hmm. And and I do it while gardening or something. Mm -hmm. There's not the time yeah. for that yet. And yeah, that's usually, I can do that. And it's very enjoyable. What, The Origin of the Species is, is an audio book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I actually got both. I got the text because it's public domain, of course, mm. Uh, mm. and and I got the audio book. I sort of just uh, sometimes I'd sort of you know do them both at the same time. Yeah, uh, yeah, me too. Know, some some of the language is you know obviously very archaic, and uh, uh, and uh, the the biological term in other years a little bit you know, less familiar to me um, because it, obviously biology hadn't developed very much at that time. So obviously they're using a, a lot of different terms. So it was just useful to, to be able to see it in text as well as by listening to it. Uh, but, but it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's a very long book and uh, I can see why people give up on it. Uh, but I think it was well worth it, well worth it. Um, at least it's one of these books which, you know, uh, every, everybody knows about, but very few people have actually read, you know. Yeah, yeah, like like the one of um, Stephen Hawkins, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Everyone has. Everyone well, I haven't knows. actually. I know. I, well, I've I've resisted buying. I've never bought it. And I've never read it. So, and I've never quite <laughs> listened to it either. Although I am listening to one uh, book on uh, well, which I guess you could call physics, um, uh, which is sort of a little bit out of my normal comfort zone, which is uh, interesting. 
uh, but still relates very much to the sort of my biological interests and things like that. There's one book I do read at the moment or, or listen to, and it's on ADD by Gabor Mati. So it's um, Attentional Deficit Disorder. Mm. And so there's a big one. He, um, and it, he has put together a lot of information about it, which is good, but it completely puts this um, neurodivergent brain structure uh, as a um, as a result of trauma, very early childhood trauma in the way of uh, there's insecure attachment to your main caregivers and uh, that might not be much, you know, just that they didn't kind of coo at you. And, um, and that is what causes it, early childhood trauma. Mm. And so then the rest of the book and all the phenomena of what a neurodivergent brain like that might be good at, not so good at, is seen in a, in a detrimental way. So this is what happens. You can't concentrate on this anymore. You will not finish anything. You can't change it. You can't keep time, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a, a list of deficits. Mm. And I, I listen to this and, and my heart sinks because I got a lot of people who have that brain setting and I just can't get on with the thought they, they quite, sometimes they're very knowledgeable about it and they quite like the kind of, everyone likes a trauma in, in my mm -hmm. world. Um, that's very, um, uh, that, that speaks to people, you know, trauma, you know, that's where it comes from. And, and I say, what if it has really nothing to do with trauma? It's just one way of being in the world uh, and, mm -hmm. and we're set up like that. What, where the trauma comes from is that our culture at the moment doesn't cater for it whatsoever. You get immediately bruised if you're neurodivergent in your thinking, mm -hmm. because you don't fit into no mainstream schools. Uh, you know, you will get it wrong from the start. Mm -hmm. And and that is the, the trauma lies not that it caused the condition, mm -hmm. but that this condition is, is not going to thrive and all the positive, the benefits of it will get apparent because you will be po possibly much more um, uh, uh, closer to being creative. Uh, you will not uh, think along the norms immediately and how to fit in. You're somewhat released from that, from that, and therefore maybe address the world in a in a in a freer way. And there's all these benefits that one could make up so easily and see that it, uh, you know, so. In a world where it is not the end all, if you're five minutes late, maybe it's not such a tragic thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have other, you know, just it's just our setups which don't allow for that and therefore call that a deficiency and not being able to rather than. Oh, look at that. You just go about your life more organically. You know, you saw that this needed to be finished because before you could go elsewhere and therefore you were late for the other. I mean, that might be inconvenient, but it mm -hmm. isn't necessarily necessary a deficiency over to you. What, yeah. is, was that a clear argument? Oh, absolutely. Or, mm -hmm. It's like... Well, you know, Rich, you know Richard Rogers, who died recently, the architect. Yes, he is a. He was ADD, wasn't he? Well, he, well, he? he was. He he said that he gave. He attributes his creativity to dyslexia. And ah. He was, uh, mm. And uh, he said, "I could. Uh, the only reason I could do all the architecture I could do was because I was dyslexic. Because um, I think that's it. And, and at the time, he was. He's slightly." older than I am, but I mean, he, he would have been from the same similar generation where dyslexia was not invented. So dyslexia was not a thing. So you were just considered to be um, stupid because you couldn't do things that other children could do. And in school, and you're exactly right, it's because of the conditions of the school were not set up. Now, conditions of the schools have changed and dyslexia is recognized and supported in, in, 
many cases, certainly, at least it's recognized as, as existing. And I think that's probably, so you're absolutely right. It's, it's only to do with the fact that our system is wrong, the culture is wrong, or it is not, it isn't set up to accept um, people who are different from the majority. And therefore, um, it, it creates the idea of trauma. That it's not, it's not, it's, it's not a problem. It's only being perceived as a problem because of the way our culture set it, set up. And it reminds me of well, there are lots of things, but there's a bit in the film Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. Just reminded me of. I don't know whether you ever seen it. It's a, quite an old film where he is a white settler who's become somehow adopted by Native American tribe. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting at the time. It's quite an interesting perspective at the time because it was the first film, I think, where instead of having cowboys and Indians, you had a perspective from the Native American perspective. Hollywood but there's a character in it who's quite obviously gay and a Native American and yet he is never perceived as being he's always perceived as being special and exciting and interesting from the Native American tribe's perspective and it's obviously something that was put in I don't have no idea whether it's, it's was there any evidence for it but it was it was it, it was interesting to see and it was one of the first portrayals of somebody who's homosexual as being a sort of a, a hero or a, a, a very interesting figure within um, that. And it was the suggestion was, well, that's because their culture was different and the culture was much more acceptance of di accepting of diversity. Whereas we have been less accepting of diversity, but are becoming more accepting. Well, that, that's certainly the case in Java. You know, traditional Javanese society, you know, it's, you know, you know it was very tolerant of, well, what we would call neurodivergence or, you know, um, behavioral divergence. Uh, you know, homosexuality was just, you know, people, well, he's just like that. <laughs> it wasn't sort of, you know, a, a, you know, a thing. What well, probably, I, don't, I doubt there, was, there actually is words for, you know, homosexual, but, but they're not really. Yeah, they're not really all that pejorative or anything, but you know, so it's so, you know, a very high degree of tolerance, but not not. It wasn't as if they're, they're, they're trying to be lifted up and sort of. Uh, uh, um, uh, they're just part of the, the environment that was probably the, the the way that they were looked at, uh, to the extent that even um, well certain. Cults in Java. Well, I, I don't think you call it a cult, but the, that's probably the best I can get. Uh, were, were basically pedophiles, and even they were tolerated. Now you sort of think, whoa, <laughs> now how, that's, maybe that's going a bit far. Uh, but you know, they they still exist. Uh, uh, These basically they're sort of like gurus who basically take in young boys, and you know, from Western eyes sexually abused them. Uh, and that is tolerated. The Javanese society will tolerate that as being, well, they're just like that. Uh, so, you know, obviously, you know, some of these things can be a little bit too much for, <laughs> for some of us, but, uh, but, it, but you know, it does show <laughs> that, you know, there is uh, you know, elements of tolerance within many traditional societies. Who, who just accept people as, uh, as as how they are because that's the way they are, and there's no particular categories for them, or not always categories for them. Uh, divergence is accepted as sort of thing, uh, just normal. So, so you know, yeah, but but you know, as as uh, Javanese society is becoming more Islamized. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional outlook still exists, but, you know, but that toleration still exists, but there's a, you know, a market intolerance uh, um, that, that's been growing over the past 20 years, especially um, uh, as towards uh, homosexuality in particular. Whereas before, 
it, it, there simply wasn't that stigma at all. It just wasn't a thing. You know, you get these, uh, uh, you know, what they call benchong, which is sort of like, I don't know, the, the, the equivalent might be lady boys. We're just a part of the environment. Um, you know, they're just, they're just always there. And that, that, that wasn't, and, and, it, and that's even sort of, you know, even in the in traditional Islam, there was a provision for, you know, the, you know for, for men, women, and lady boys. Uh, you know, they are actually mentioned and accommodated within within you know the way that uh, um, uh, Islam was organised in, in in traditional Java. So you know, yeah. So so yeah, so yeah some many societies have a, have a great tolerance and, and 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 have no problems with divergence. Uh, but it's only these um, you know. Abrianic uh, uh, religions and and, uh, and uh, uh, religious structures that seem to try to sort of systematize and uh, you know humans or, or or categorize humans into what what is normal and, and what is uh, not normal uh, to reduce uh, divergence basically. Well, look, it's time. Time's moving on. Yeah. So, I'm, I, but there was one thing I wanted to mention. I is that I'm now doing my day skipper course. Oh, so really? I'm I'm going to 